Assalamu alaikum listeners and welcome to Radio Ramadan Wolverhampton on 87.9 FM. My name is Abeda Ahmed and I'm going to be your host for the next hour inshallah. So our show Women in Health will look to explore women's health issues by hearing from p- different people who have experienced health issues and also hearing from women who are working in different health and social care uh, professions. So we hope to be able to inspire our fellow sisters to go out and work in all these wonderful roles or if you're someone who's struggling, we just want to give you that bit of strength and sabr to get through your difficult time, inshallah. First up this week, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Isma Iqbal, who's a consultant ENT and a skull-based surgeon. Now, mashallah, there are lots of women doctors out there, but not many women, particularly Muslim women, go down the surgical route. And we're going to speak to Dr. Isma and try and explore why we think this is. So, Dr. Isma Iqbal, welcome to Radio Ramadan, Wolverhampton. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you, Abeda, for inviting me. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, I, before we go any further, I am you're an NHS worker, and thank you for all the work that you've done in the pandemic. And our whole community is very grateful for all your efforts. Thank you. Um, it's um, I guess you get sawab also whilst doing work, so it's a blessing having a job. But having a job like this is a, certainly a true blessing. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So it's my um. And Asha, we want to focus on uh, women's health and um, also looking at women who have uh, careers in healthcare. So if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about the role that you play and what a typical day in your in your work life is. OK, um, so I'm a consultant ENT surgeon. Um, the fancy word for it is uh, otorhinolaryngologist. And I'm also a skull based surgeon. So um, I trained to be a surgeon. You, so you go to medical school and then you do some generic training, which is called your foundation training. And then I did core surgical training where you get exposure to a few different surgical specialities. And then you do specialist training. So at each level, there's a competitive entry process. So you have to have done some projects, some audits, um, some exams, and also sort of some service improvements or trying to work out ways of helping patients uh, and helping deliver healthcare to patients. And then the specialist training program is six years. So you do six years of training. And in my speciality, that is ear, nose and throat. So that's your basic terminology for it. So um, I subspecialized in sinus surgery, but I do a bit of everything. So that sort of from simple things like children with fluid behind the eardrum, that's called glue ear, to children that need tonsils taken out, to things like uh, sinus cancers and head and neck cancers and thyroid problems. So an ENT surgeon deals with all of that. And then once I finished my specialist training, which was six years, I did a fellowship, which is super specialist training in sinus surgery and nasal surgery. So I did that in Australia. And then I worked out there for a year. Um, And then I've been a consultant for about two to three years. I did a one year uh, stint as a consultant in Australia because I really enjoyed it out there. And then I've been back for just about two years now. So I work in a tertiary referral center, which is a teaching hospital. So you get to teach the medical students as well. Oh, Masha, that sounds like you've had quite a journey. It sounds, um, I think one of the things I would say, listening to all of that is that when you think of a doctor or you think, you know, you think they've they've done their A levels and they've studied medicine and that's about it, Mm. you don't realise how how long the journey it is to get to where you are now. Uh, Well, once you finish your A levels, you're just really happy that you got into medical school. (laughs) Uh, And then you just start to jump through various hurdles as as time goes on. Yeah. How, How did you find that? I mean, it sounds like you have to do a lot of studying do you find that you know balancing your family life and studying how's that been for you um I think study yes you have to devote a lot of time studying and there's a lot of personal time sacrifice so that is something that you should be aware of I mean with studying everyone studies slightly differently and uh, you know you always hear people saying uh, work smart not hard Mm-hmm. And really, the trick to that is finding out what works for you and working out what your study style is. So I worked out that I was a visual learner. So for me, drawing things out, making diagrams, that works better for me. 
yeah. uh, and practicing a lot of questions works for me. So really the trick is finding what works best for you uh, and then managing your time. That I mean, in any profession, time management is really important, but certainly in medicine, you need to have good time management and multitasking skills, um, but you have to prioritize and you will give up some of your personal life in order to have a medical career. Okay, so a little throwback for you here, back to your A-level days and when you first started mm. out in medicine. And, you know, as a, as a community, we put a lot of pressure on our children. We want all of, them, all of our kids to be doctors. You know how it is. Sure. Um, yeah, so do you have any advice either both for the parents, with children going through it, and for the actual students? Um, I'd say for the students, um, you maybe should try and do a taster in a hospital. Obviously, with the pandemic, you know, usually we have people come sort of at the A-levels to come and have a visit and sort of just shadow and, and see what being a doctor is like. There's actually a lot of paperwork in being a doctor, uh, whether you're a, a GP or a medical doctor or a surgeon. I, I still have a lot of paperwork and people, you know, I, I always say that, you know, uh, that's not something that is highlighted when you go for a medical career. Um, so visiting is good um, and speaking to people that are in the profession and also just evaluating what sort of a, a career you want. Uh, you know, I chose surgery because I like working with my hands. I like problem solving. Um, it, you know, it, some people might choose something like psychiatry because they like to talk to people to work out what their problems are. They, ha they have a different way of approaching the issue. So uh, trying to work out whether medicine is a good idea for you to start off with. Um, there are long hours, particularly in the first 10 years of training, uh, and you do have to study a lot. Um, but also, you know, there's a lot of reward. Um, and with regards to parents, um, you know, my parents were very keen, as all Asian parents are, for <laughs> a child to become a doctor. Um, and part of their perspective was, oh, you'll always have a job now. The pandemic has probably hit that home for a lot of people. Um, you know, what the, their perspective was, you know, anywhere you go in the world, you'll have a job. And that is very true. And uh, through my career, I've had the opportunity to travel a lot of places where I've presented internationally at, at, at talks. And you get to travel and meet other people from other backgrounds, which is very interesting. But from a parent perspective, I'd say uh, you've got to really see whether that career suits your child um, and whether they have a genuine interest in it because it's a lifelong commitment it's not just going to five years of medical school and you're finished um, mm, uh, say if, you know if you put that sort of pressure on someone who perhaps isn't it's a high stress uh, profession and there is a lot more awareness within the profession about how stress and anxiety can have an impact on individuals but it is something to bear in mind. It's it's not everyone's cup of tea. And it's really making sure that that's genuinely what your child wants to do, but also whether they're suited to that sort of a thing, because you can have the accolade, but it may not be something that, that suits you. Yeah, that that's some great advice. Then I hope all of the parents uh, really do take that on board. Um, life's stressful enough without all the extra stress. Hey, mm, yeah, yeah. So, um, Isma, as, um, I remember listening to a talk recently from um, a female surgeon, and she was a Muslim as well, and she was saying that there's not really many Muslim females who go into surgery. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that's true? Or, and do you think, and if, if it is, um, why? Why do you think that we don't go that far with it? With it? Uh, generally, surgery, I'd, say, I'd go as far as saying generally surgery is not a, a female profession. Mm -hmm. um, but if we look at the last five years or 10 years, um, just in the surgical college, there are a lot more females. Um, and certainly in my subspecialty, there are more females than in, say, other surgical specialties, say, like orthopedics or colorectal surgery. So there is an increasing number of women. Um, but then you come to women from a Muslim background and there aren't that many of them. Mm -hmm. I think part of the issue is that it is a career that demands a lot of personal sacrifice um, and 
so you have to do night shifts. I've done 24 hour on calls. Um, you have to have a family that's supportive of that. And you know, when I was a trainee at one point, I did 48 hour on calls. It means that you will have to answer the call and go into hospital whenever that call comes, whether that call came at three o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. I've had nights where I've been awake all night doing work. Now, wow. that is something that your family needs to be supportive of. Mm-hmm. You do also do shift work in medicine also, but it tends to be more shift work, whereas with surgery, it's sort of on call. You'll be called in whenever you're needed. And the more senior you are, the intensity of that sort of changes. But uh, it also depends on which speciality you're in. So I think part of it, it is the work-life balance. Um, it is a career where, you know, you can't just say, I'm going to move there and there's the local hospital and I want to get a job as a surgeon there. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, jobs don't become available because it's convenient for you. So I think that's yeah. one of the reasons. Um, it is a male-dominated um, profession and uh, I'm quite lucky in my department you know when I was a trainee here they only had one female consultant now we've got six within the department so things are changing I'm the only Muslim uh, in my department female wise I've got some male Muslim colleagues Uh, but I think it's a perception more than anything else but it is a demanding work-life balance and I think that's part partly the issue there yeah I think you know we all want to have these wonderful doctors in our family or our children or you know but I think what a lot of the people who have come on the show have said is that is having that balance and having that family Mm. support and if really we want our our children to be successful we have to give them that you know you know give them that fair chance by making sure that everyone knows that some of us will have to take a sacrifice for the other one to be successful or how we can support yeah, them. That's the, and I think as a community, we've got a lot of work to do there. I, I think, yeah, certainly it's, um, as you said, everyone wants that accolade, but um, they don't know exactly how much support goes into that. I've had, you know, times where I was revising for my exam and say, you know, if my mum wasn't around, my dad, bless him, would make food and say, oh, do you want to come down and eat whilst oh. I was revising for an exam? Yeah. Uh, and so I was very lucky, alhamdulillah, that I have parents that would do that. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And, uh, and I hope, inshallah, we all can become those parents who are very supportive, inshallah. Mm. Um, so, so how is um, shift work and fasting and, and namaz breaks and all of that? How do, you, how do you make time for all of that? I suppose you can't just walk out of surgery and say, I've got to go and open my fast. Uh, so, you know, you can't, you can't do that. So uh, I'll say probably the summer months help with the, the prayers. Um, and the, the, most hospitals will have a prayer room and it kind of depends on what your work schedule's like. Um, I, I'll admit I, I come home and do most of my namaz in the winter, certainly because, uh, because, you know, by the time you're finished, I've been, you know, in clinic and I can't really leave clinic yeah. uh, to say I'm going to pray. But um, certainly most place, most hospitals have a prayer room and an area where they have a masala. So you can pray at work, um, but you have to fit it into uh, when you have time available. Now, one of the issues with that, and my, my mom never understood this, that you don't get a lunch break. <laughs> so, um, so you know as a doctor you don't get a lunch break you get a day's work and you fit in your eating and drinking and whatever during your day um, and that's you're an adult and you manage your time uh, yeah. and sometimes or most of the time that, that there's too much work especially as a junior doctor to do to have have lunch or fit or normally you have lunch at three o'clock or something like that you know it's it depends on what's what rotation you're doing so it is challenging to fit mm-hmm. in uh, certainly I've always found prayers difficult to fit in so I've usually come home and, and repeated them with the you know may I accept them that I don't yeah. know whether that's the right way to do it but that's what I do yeah. um fasting I've never found a, a huge issue for me you know generally in fasting it's the sleep deprivation and trying to manage your sleep yeah. that is tricky uh, but certainly yeah it's just you know broken sleep is obviously going to be challenging and uh, generally most surgical specialties start work at eight um, medical specialties start at nine so you so you've got to get up early um, mm-hmm. and 
you know, they, most people will find after they do suhoor, if they get up for it, that they find it difficult to get back to sleep. So it's trying to manage the, for me, the sleep. Um, yeah. And then if you're on call, you know, you might be in the middle. I've been in the middle of an, you know, an airway emergency where someone's having difficulty breathing. You can't really nip off to grab no. a date at that point. No. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy of... to hear you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you kind of look at the time and, you know, you, you in your hearts, you break your fast. And, I'm, you know, I'd, I gather one of the, one of my um, cousins, she's she's done some sort of she's a bit of an Islamic scholar. And she said, you know, you can just swallow your saliva and, and, and that suffices. But, you know, Allah is forgiving and merciful. And, and that Absolutely. there's a life life saving reason why you're not breaking your fast at that point. Yeah. Um, or you'll be sitting on the table and you'll break your fast and you'll get called in to go into hospital. Um, and that must be hard as well. Yeah, so those are yeah. the things that you've got to curtail. If you're doing night shift, you have to plan it. So, yeah, again, you. I've had times where I used to do a week of nights where I'd get called just at Sahur time and you're, you're thinking, oh. all right, I'll just... And then you just end up drinking water and fasting. I know some people do that anyway, but for me, I always, I like getting up for suhoor. For me, that's, I, I quite enjoy that. That's, yeah, I, I enjoy it more than iftar. It? Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy that more than the iftar. I, I like that oh. time of the morning. It's nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, f- that it is challenging and, you know, you take your, your whatever you're going to eat with you or say you're going to a night shift and your fast is going to open at 10 or 11 as it used to in the summer. Uh, and you take something with you, so you have to plan. Mm. You know, well, I suppose you your... miss out on all the um, all the family atmosphere and all that as well, don't you? Well, that's it. Yeah, you, yeah. you do. Um, and it's sort of working around that, and and having an understanding family. I remember when I was a junior doctor. You know, uh, I was we were supposed to go out for a family birthday, and I got multiple calls, but I was busy. You know, <laughs> way after I was meant to finish, and oh. you don't, you just don't make it sometimes. Yeah. Or it'll be a birthday dinner and you'll be called out. Uh, and that's just part and parcel of the job. Yeah, that's that's tough. I suppose yeah. your family have to be understanding, like you said, that, but it is tough. That's the reality that's of it, it as exactly. well, though, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So it's me, you, I know um, a few years ago now, Mashallah, you started wearing the hijab, didn't you? Um, like yeah. later, on, later on in your career. So how, how did mm. that change things for you or did it change things for you? um so I, it's been about 10 years now I didn't hadn't realized you know wow, when I, 10 years I, I remember when you first started right? a, <laughs> yeah so um I think I was about 30 when I started and I had gotten into surgical training that's not why I started wearing it but for me wearing the hijab had been a very personal thing I tried it out um and I, I sort of thought well if I put it on I don't want to take it off which you know mm-hmm. you, you don't know how you're going to feel once you're wearing it so for me, I very naively thought this is a very personal choice. And I did a lot of self-reflection uh, and then I wore it. And um, I started wearing it uh, in Ramadan. I remember it was 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd said to my work colleagues, I said, well, I'm, it's the first of Ramadan. I've decided I'm going to wear hijab. And I, from, from tomorrow, I'm going to come in hijab. Uh, my work colleagues were fine, very supportive. But generally, you find medics are very forthcoming to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's then most medics are quite open to to different perspectives, uh, and they're, they're more aware of different religions. So, um, from a colleague perspective, I don't think there was a difference. From a personal perspective, I thought this is like just me doing this thing, um, and then I kind of noticed. <laughs> Uh, once I walked into work with it on, I kind of thought, oh, I kind of inadvertently am now representing the religion in a way, mm. um, which kind of dawned on me when I entered my first clinic, not because somebody had said anything, but, you know, I just thought, if I now do anything that, say, is is perceived as being negative in any way, they're not going to say it was that doctor. They're going to say it was the Muslim woman. Mm. Uh, and um it's I, a big responsibility, I kind of, isn't it? well that's the thing because I hadn't really put it on even thinking about any of those repercussions because mm. I was just thinking about me and my connection with Allah I wasn't thinking of 
anybody else uh, yeah. and um which was very naive I afterwards I reflected on it and I kind of thought mm, I don't really think about that so mm. I became very aware of my behavior yeah um just more because you don't want to you know inadvertently uh, leave someone with a negative impression of your religion because of the fact that it was your behavior that sort of caused that I, I mean I tend to think I'm fairly pleasant at work but you know I work. became very aware of everything well maybe, maybe at home as well but um, I became very very aware of it um, so it um, yeah I, I don't I, think I can understand I can completely relate to that I think there'll be a lot of sisters out there who will relate to that whatever our professional our day-to-day life is I think wearing the hijab you you know you're a, a visual um, representative of Islam and it, you don't realize what people will think and we don't none of us want to bring bad to the religion purposely so no I'll make it easy for all of us all of our sisters yeah, to do I mean, job, inshallah um, but I'm sure you do a great job I'm sure you do, you represent us well yeah and yeah. my patients I've not I've had you know I've had some patients uh, comment um uh, I remember one chap said, oh, you know, it's something about the Bible. And then he apologized. I was like, you don't need to apologize oh, to me because yeah. <laughs> you talked oh, about the Bible. You haven't offended us. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've had, actually, I had a, a, a young girl um, and to, she came to see me a few times in clinic. And her mom actually said, um, can we just ask? Because um, we're quite religious. They, they, they were Christian. And she said, um, you know, my child has been asking why you wear the veil. And oh. um, uh, and I said, no, that, that's fine. Um, I, because I hadn't been asked. And I said, well, you know, it's it's a prof- it's uh, an expression of love for God. Um, mm-hmm. But I said, you know, next time you go to church, because there were church girls, I said, you have a look at the pictures in your church that depict Mary um, and you'll see that she is also wearing a hijab Mm. and um, they kind of reflect and said actually that's very true we just had never ever thought of it like that yeah you know a Christian depiction of Mary is with a white hijab on yeah (laughs) typically yeah but but um, it's because it's just not connected that way. And actually, you know, that was quite nice because they asked me about it rather than making any assumptions. Yeah, I have had, it's you know, important to have these conversations, isn't it? I think yeah. a lot of things, people are told that you should be thinking like this. So it, mm. it's, not, it's really important to have these conversations in our day to day lives. And that's the only way that, people are going to those barriers are going to break down and everyone feels comfortable with it that way. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for people to ask me questions. Um, and, and I've had some uh, patients, some patients just uh, passing comments. I remember one lady, we, we finished the consultation as she left. She said, oh, you're such a beautiful girl, but I don't know why they make you cover your head and walked oh. out. She didn't give me a chance to even respond to it. And I just kind of looked at her thinking, oh, gosh, it's not a punishment. I know. But... <laughs> gosh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh, so, maybe maybe one day you'll get that chance to speak to her. You never know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh, so you know, you've been on an incredible journey. Um, just uh, looking back and thinking, what would you do differently, if anything, when you started out, or any part of your career? Is there anything that you would do differently now? Um, that's a difficult question. Um, Sorry. I think you would. <laughs> I, if anything, I would take more opportunities. Say yes a lot more to okay. projects to experiences um I I do tend to do that generally but maybe I would have been a bit more focused um and I I'm the first medic in my family I didn't have much guidance Mm. and so it was all very new and I think you know in hindsight you know maybe you would have maybe I would have done more projects maybe I would have sort of said yes to going to different places a bit more um those sorts of things that you know I've I've always wanted to maybe go and do some uh, charity work and operating but that you know for me like one thing you're wary wary of as a Muslim woman is you know going into those environments you know what is it going to be like in terms of security and not putting yourself in a a very vulnerable position Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's just been one of the, the reasons why I haven't done that because I didn't want my parents having that worry that I've gone to the middle of nowhere and yeah you know yeah so 
And mashallah, you've had an incredible career. You should be really happy with what you've achieved. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've, you've worked really hard to, to get where you are. And I hope that, you know, people listen to your story and they feel inspired because I definitely am. I would I won't go out and be a, become a doctor suddenly I'll tell you that <laughs> but, but definitely encouraging women to go down especially down the surgery route I think a lot of yeah. women, women who become doctors tend to go and become GPs and which is fine you know whatever but yeah but to go and to do carry on to surgery I think we need to see Muslim women in every profession personally so thank you very That's much for it. coming and- on the show yeah, and I'll just mention a bit that like the college, the Royal College of Surgeons um, surgical training programs are a lot more open to flexible working now. Um, mm-hmm. Employers are more open to flexible working. I have a couple of friends that have got children that have gone into part time training. It means that your training takes longer, but you can do that. So it's something to bear in mind. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's really good to know. So, so, so listen, sisters, if you're interested, you please go out and do your research. And there's always a way of, of making things happen. And if you're determined, you can. And uh, thank you very much, Isma, for coming on to the show. It's been no really, problem. really interesting. This is Ramadan Radio. Little Dessert Shop continues to expand with stores in Bilston, Wolverhampton and Wensfield. During Ramadan, we're celebrating our show-stopping dunking box for only £25. Feed the family with this exquisitely presented Iftari gift, featuring the best from our menu. Enter Ramadan 25 at the checkout on our incredible new website. Visit littledessertshop.co.uk today. The holy month of gifting. From all at Little Dessert Shop, we'd like to wish you a blessed Ramadan and a huge Easter. Mubarak. Do you have a family member that's passed away and you would like someone to assist you in legal advice? Kenneth Jones Solicitors has been providing legal services for businesses and individuals since 1986. We specialize in probate, Islamic wills and family law. We also offer services in conveyancing, immigration and personal injury. Contact us today on 01902 or visit us on our website at kenneth-jones.co.uk. Mubi Base Electronic, specialist in car audio and home entertainment. Suppliers of leading brands, Samsung, Sony, and Panasonic. We supply and fit all car audio systems, top brands, Kenwood, Bose, and we're an authorized supplier of Vibe product. Visit our store online at mubibase.co.uk and order today for next day delivery. Mubi Base Electronics are proud sponsors of Wolverhampton Wanderers FC. Call us today for a free quote on 01902-754-546 and quote Ramadan 20 for 10% off. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Movie Base Electronics, specialist in car audio and home entertainment. Is your home protected from the unexpected? It can be with Home Cover Plan, Wolverhampton's fastest growing home emergency cover from as little as fourteen fifty a month. That's right, but just fourteen fifty a month, Home Cover Plan will protect your boiler, radiators, electrics, plumbing, and any other home emergencies with no catches, no call out charges, and no excess charges, plus a boiler service. What's more, for Ramadan 2020, we're offering fifteen percent off our policy with the code RAMADAN15. Go to homecoverplan.co.uk now and join the many thousands already enjoying the benefits. Your tyres are essential for safe driving. They're the only link between your vehicle and the road. At Premier Tyres, we proudly stock leading tyre brands such as Goodyear, Michelin, Pirelli and more. We're also your go-to garage for MOTs, servicing, exhausts and all your mechanical needs. With the most affordable prices in town, unmatched quality, knowledgeable and fully qualified mechanics, we will look after your car no matter the make or model. Premier Tyres, Crown Street, WV1, 1PX. Call 01902 455 684 or visit premiertireservices.com Are you in receipt of benefits and looking for cavity wall or underfloor insulation? Did you know, with Northern Gas Heating, you could get a free boiler with the insulation measure of your choice. Call 0800 083 1000 or go to northerngasheating.com to see if you're eligible. It's a quick and easy assessment. Northern Gas Heating, celebrating over 20 years in the industry. We're proud to be the UK's local central heating company. Pack Continental, your local best halal supermarket in Wolverhampton. Established for over 20 years, we pride ourselves on our fresh vegetables and fresh fruit. We have a variety of spices and lentils. We're also an award-winning halal butcher of the year for two consecutive years. We supply excellent quality meat and poultry delivered fresh daily to our store. Visit us today at 1-3. to 
3 Hunter Street, Wolverhampton, WV6 0QZ or call 01902 717 792. Open 9am till 8pm Monday to Saturday and 10am till 6pm on Sundays. Go to RamadanRadioWolves.com and donate to your local mosque. Welcome back, listeners. And now we're going to go into our second and final interview for today's show. Please welcome Sister Sarah Hameen, who is a senior nurse at a local A&E department in a hospital. Introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and, and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all. My name is Sarah Hamid, and I am a senior sister in Wosan Minor, uh, Wosan Minor Emergency Department. And same time, I am an advanced life support instructor also in Wosan Minor. Not only in Wosan Minor, I can go any trust. Um, yeah. Wow, that, that, that title itself just sounds so intense, mashallah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, um, okay, sister, so this is a, a women's health show. We want to discuss not only like women's health issues, but we want to hear from women who are working in the health profession. And, uh-huh. and, and we all know that during this pandemic, it's been a, the health profession has been under a lot of stress. So yeah. what would you say is like a, a, a typical day for you, in, in, in a typical shift in the life of Sarah? Uh, to be honest, uh, as I told before, that is, uh, I'm a senior sister in Wasamala Riri. Mm-hmm. So my main job is to manage the department. So manage the department in the sense to manage the patients and the staff. Okay. So it's, it is really a very difficult uh, post and it is very difficult to manage. You can manage the patient, but it is very difficult to manage the staff. Yeah. As it is <laughs> in charge because you are the main person in that shift. Okay. And I do 12 and a half hour shift. So I have to wow. find out, you know, lots of ambulance are coming via the front line and you need to find out where is where I need to keep these patients. And everyone knows that the Boston Manor ED is a very small ED. Mm. And inshallah, in next year, we will have a um, big a So it is everything when it comes to, and the main time, you need to achieve the target, like ambulance handover, triage timing, you know, timely seeing the patients, timely um, sending the patients to the ward, that national four hours targets. So everything yeah. is everything. I am the all around everywhere I have to reach. So Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah. Pressure, then. Yeah, it is a yeah, really, really a very pressurable job. Yeah. Oh, but to wow. be honest, uh, you know, my, uh, because this is my passion, I'm very passionate about my job. Mm-hmm. And Alhamdulillah, I start my job with uh, Bismillah and I finish my job with Alhamdulillah and I go home without any stress. So it is the way, how do you manage? How do you cope? Because yeah. if you can't be able to cope your stress. You're never going to achieve anything. So you should cope that. Absolutely. So, so have um, you got any I, tips for us how you how you manage your stress? Because I imagine your job is very intense and it's very you know, time sensitive, like you said. Yeah, that is what I said, because you should have a passion and you should enjoy whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Even a housewife, the same thing, isn't it? Because yeah. if you're not enjoying as a housewife, you're never going to achieve anything. So if you I know this is my bread and butter and I have a passion and I enjoy my life and I enjoy my job. Because uh, don't forget, I'm a full-time mother as well. So yeah, I got <laughs> and, have, and the best thing is my family. If I, mm-hmm. my family didn't support me, I don't think so I can do anything. I can achieve anything in as a profession. Because if you, there is no family support, you're not, never going to do anything. So Alhamdulillah, in that sense, I am very grateful and I'm very lucky woman. Alhamdulillah. So, so we've had other guests on and they've said that practically said the same thing as you that in, in order for us to be successful out there at work we need to have that support at home and it's really yeah. important for us um, yeah. So yeah you've said the same and it, it, it definitely I hope that all the brothers who are out there listening today if you want your wives to go out and be successful in their professional careers or your daughters yeah. you have to step up and support them and you have yeah. to support your family yeah. and, and, and your children have to do their bit as well yeah, yeah. family Parents, brothers, you know, everyone should support. As a woman, people will think, no, she can't go out. No, that mentality has to change. They mm-hmm. have to support our girls. They have to be independent. How do they go into independent? They can't be able to go out. 
So mm-hmm. if the father didn't allow them, they can't able to do anything in their life. Or no, you know, it's not that women, we grown up, we have a good life with our family and then married and then, you know, go to husband's house. That is, I don't think so. That is only a women's life, to be honest. Mm-hmm. They have to- changed now, haven't they? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it is changed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can get married and, and have a family at the same time as working and have a successful career. And, you know, you're yeah. one of the people who's proved that. And, and alhamdulillah, it, it is possible. You just have to be, I suppose, organized and, and have that structure at home to support you. Yeah. The thing is, because, uh, you know, I come from India. I have no family here. Uh-huh. Only my my husband. So, you know, I got three daughters, beautiful daughters, mashallah. So, um, so if because if my husband didn't support me, you know, I don't have anybody else in this, uh, you know, when I come. So if my dinner husband didn't support me, I don't think so. And I'll buy Allah's help, you know, otherwise I wouldn't reach in this position, to be honest. MashaAllah. Allah reward yeah. your husband and uh, help everyone's husbands to be as supportive, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> So Sarah, tell us, um, so, you know, in, in this pandemic in the last year, we, I imagine it's been pretty intense in the A&E department. Um, yeah. What was the hardest challenge for you? You know, with uh, what I said before, that we are the frontline staff. Yeah. You know, we have to accept every patient first, especially mm. in pandemic. It was a very challenging and hardest because lots of COVID patients. The COVID-19 is a very new for everybody. You know, the starting itself, we don't know what to do, how to manage, where to put yeah. the patient and be able to mix the patients. But, you know, as, as a team, we achieved everything. Hmm. And the, 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 the hardest thing is, you know, lots of young people coming in, young, young people as a patient, they come into the department and, you know, they have a COVID. Some, you know, some of them passed away, some of them into oh. ITU. The hardest, the hardest thing is the family. You know, yeah. the family, they can't be able to come and see their loved ones. Mm. Someone is dying, they can't even hold their hands. You know, looking at that, watching that, it's so painful, really, really painful. Oh. So, you know. But how, do you, how do you see that and then switch off and go home? How, how do you do it that? Is very, you know what? Because... I have to switch off because I have chosen to become an emergency nurse. Emergency mm-hmm. nurse. If I haven't switch off from my head, I never going to achieve anything. Mm-hmm. I will be stressed throughout my life. I have to somehow. I have to manage. I have to switch it off because I ha- I'm seeing this every single day. If I didn't cope this, if I can't able to cope that situation, mm-hmm. if I you know, I don't think so I can able to achieve anything. I don't think so tomorrow I can go and treat anybody or yeah, I can. Because that's the I nature of your it. job, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. I took to become an emergency nurse. Mm-hmm. So, um, so what kind of things do you do to relax or switch off? What kind of things? Do- uh, to be honest, uh, I don't do anything much really because my home life is a very, you know, I got a very good life, family mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Switch off and, uh, um, to switch off, I come here. Um, I don't discuss much about the department or anything. These yeah. type of things I, at home, to be honest. When I come home, you know, sit with the family, have a dinner. You know, yeah. the kids will say something, and then you get to you get to relax at home, don't you? That's, so that's your switch off, isn't it? Yeah, my husband will put some, you know, video clips and nice I suppose, Yeah. So I suppose all, with the pan- pandemic, we haven't been able to do much anyway, have we? It was just literally work, home, work, home. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. To be honest, you know, it didn't bother me at all because I I go to work three days a week. I do 12 and a half hour shift and four days I started to home and relax, you know, do our yeah. daily work. Uh, mm. It didn't, I don't go much out anyway because I'm not that person and it didn't bother me much. So I didn't. Okay, good. Have, yeah, so just come home and sit with the family and enjoy. That's it, really, yeah. and pray. Us and read Quran. Sarah, can I ask how is um, how is shift work with the um, you know like obviously we're being a Muslim with namaz and fasting and family life. How is uh, working around the shift work with for you? Um, to be honest, Abeda, I'm working in this department eighteen years. Wow. I problem alhamdulillah um i always pray always the facilities are there masala there quran is there and there's a place is there mm-hmm. and i go and pray 
on time and fasting there is no problem at all for fasting because uh you know i think for me as a person personally if i say i'm more energetic when i'm fasting because mm. uh, you know at home you're sitting you know you're not doing much at home you mm. know you are uh, lazy really but at work <laughs> you're working <laughs> and uh, you will be very energetic and of course, um, the time goes quicker as well doesn't it when you're at work uh, yeah and yeah. my is my matron my staff they all are very supportive and they knew Absolutely. you know i'm a muslim this time i need to before you know in the past because now i am a senior person mm. in the past was a staff nurse before starting the shift itself if i was doing that when i was doing the night shift i used to tell the nurse in charge i need to break the fast this time okay. and honest yeah to be honestly i'm telling this is i never had any problem you know they always allow me because it is we live in a multicultural community and everybody has to respect this isn't it absolutely so everybody knows that i'm a muslim and i have to pray i have to break my fasting so mm-hmm. uh thankfully you know i never had any problem alhamdulillah that's brilliant so and um, you you obviously do you wear hijab at work as well don't you so yeah and, i wear it's never been an issue for you either oh no that never been an issue at all to be honest in my interview in the past interview i told my matron um because i was not wearing scarf in the past when i was a staff nurse mm-hmm. but uh, i become a sister when i went for my interview i told in the interview panel itself i'm going to wear my scarf you will going to see me as a new person uh my interviewer she said oh we love to see you without scarf i said no i am <laughs> going to scarf <laughs> but to be honest obeida since i wore the scarf you know the rest, alhamdulillah alhamdulillah this okay. is true the oh. respect i got from every single person it's not only one whole trust you know from the Jeez. top chief executive you know chief operating officers everybody mashallah alhamdulillah the respect which i achieved in was a manner is an amazing and yeah. uh, I that's know it's quite that's, that's that's you you that's really nice how you give credit to the hijab for it but it's not just yes, the hijab yes. it's the whole it's your whole manner it's the way you that's, behave you work it's everything in one isn't it Yeah definitely because people you know our community maybe will think that the girls can't able to go and work in the healthcare no mm. there is no need to be to break our islamic sharia you can work in a, you know healthcare as a healthcare professional only the thing is the way you behave that's exactly the way you going to get it back absolutely so you respect your religion and your family and your community i'm definitely i'm sure you will get the respect the same so it is depends Inshallah. upon how we behave really Inshallah. so sorry do you have um, do you have many young girls muslim girls coming up in in, in your field who or... i can see that now yes there is lots of girls are coming in uh, you know muslim girls are coming to our into my field and i'm very glad that and i'm sure they all are achieving very well they all all are doing very well yes. and uh, in any department itself um i got um, i got two three muslim girls mm. uh, but you know there is no problem for them you know my department is mashallah very good department it's not that you know we are uh, you know minorities or anything yeah. no there is nothing at all we should have more and more our girls and boys to come into this profession to be honest because sure. taking care of a patient taking care of somebody as a health worker is is a, is a lovely job you know and i always encourage every single person even i encourage to my girls but then none of them don't <laughs> So, so 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 sorry i'm i'm going to um lower the tone a bit here so last uh, last year was am i right in saying that one of your colleagues was arima nasreen yeah one, yeah yeah well, was yeah. she one of your colleagues she was one of the first uh, nurses to pass away from the yeah. covid wasn't she last year um yeah the, so, so how was that for you as a department um to be honest she didn't work um, in an emergency department she worked mm-hmm. in the medical unit uh, and okay. I personally don't know Arima very well but mm-hmm. wherever I see Arima I will be always say assalamu alaikum how are you because yeah. she health care and then she become a nurse and I know I heard from every single person she was a very very good nurse she was oh, an ex nurse you know 
two days before she passed, she was in ITU. I met her. She come to my department, and mm. she was to see my matron. And I say, "Salam, how are you, Arima?" She said, "I'm good, sister." Then she told me, "Sister, I want to come to your department to work." I said, "Meet matron." So she was standing there to meet a matron. And then on third day, when I went to the department, I come to know, you know, she's in ITU. I was so upset. Mm. You know, she's, you know, the the more it is because she is one of our healthcare professional, and she's um, uh, she's working with the COVID patients. She's taking care of the COVID patients. She never bothered anything. She got a family. She got a course of more small kids, but she never bothered anything. She mm-hmm. went to, you know, treat them, take care of them, and she ended up in ITU and passed away. The mm-hmm. morale of the staff become very, very low. To be honest, mm, I can imagine. I think the whole, the whole of the Muslim community felt it when Arima passed away, yeah. especially yeah. You know, knowing that she's a young woman with young kids and. Yeah, it was very sad, very hard to 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 hear. She's very young. I can only pray to Allah, you know, keep her and then give a place in the Jannatul for those and give a patience oh. to the family. To be honest, I don't know her family, but you know, I give a patience to the family and the kids. To be honest, inshallah, uh, to all, all the all the people who have passed away, inshallah, Allah give them a good place in Jannah and, and give all their mm-hmm. families sabr. You're right. It, it, it's very difficult. I mean, you guys do an amazing job, and we're all very grateful for it. Yeah, uh, you know, I, when I, when all this was going on initially, I was like, oh, I thought to myself, I don't want my children to go into the health profession because you know it's so frontline; they don't know what they're facing. But but that was yeah. just anxiety. But now I think about it, it's such an important job, mashallah. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm a severe asthmatic. You know, yeah. I never bothered anything. To be honest, you know, I shouldn't work on the front line. I should oh, sit okay. at home. But you know what? I I told my husband, no way, I'm going to sit at home. I'm <laughs> to home you know but the thing is whatever it is allah allah is the one who has to help us Absolutely. so you allah, and the full belief on him and full faith on him and i'm sure allah will help us Inshallah. because in, you know it, it's a, it's a pandemic no one knows what to do everybody is hearing something from there something from there and then making the guidelines and then been treating the patients but you know if allah help Allah's help is there. Everything is fine. That that's what I believed, and I went for every single day. That's the way I went because I got family. You know, mm. I'm putting myself into risk, and I'm putting my my family into a risk. Yeah. But but it didn't bother me at all. It didn't bother me anything, and my kids can understand. My husband can understand. You know, I said no. I'm not going to sit at home. I have to work, and throughout my pandemic. throughout the pandemic and i worked very well you mm-hmm. know so alhamdulillah alhamdulillah we're very grateful i think that i suppose that's what makes us different from other other non believers and other uh, other faiths is the fact that we know that inevitably whatever yeah. allah wills will happen so you know if yeah. if our hearts clean and our intentions are good and we're going to work to help people and to do the right thing for our family inshallah yeah. you know what will be will be whatever allah wills for us yeah. inshallah it will be good You know, you sit at your home also. If you want, if you have to get a COVID nineteen, you will get it. Yeah, Whatever so true. It's written. It is written because just to faith on Allah, Alhamdulillah, mm-hmm. Allah will protect. No, oh, that's brilliant. But you know, we, we just as a as a Mubamtin community, we just want to say thank you to all of the healthcare staff and all the NHS workers. Alhamdulillah, you know, you've done fantastic for us. and we're here Thank today you. because of your hard work and efforts alhamdulillah so just Thank to wrap up for me sister sara just give me just just finish up for us and give us uh, some ad- final advice for our young sisters out there who are possibly considering going for a career in nursing or healthcare um, all of the thing you which i can say awareness is very important yeah mm-hmm. the awareness of the healthcare and the education is very important there are many families they don't send their children i know i can give one examples you know girls getting the they're tell they're not telling their parents they're applying for the nursing they're applying for the uh, radiographer but the parents don't allow to go them i know the girls they're still working as a csws you know health uh, health care they 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 can't able to progress their careers so the awareness the education is very important i think the lack of knowledge is making everything the knowledge is very important the mentality has to be vanished from our um, from the mind 
if you go mm. to the healthcare professional i don't you know our girls and boys are not going to be spoiled so if anybody wanted any tips or anything you know how to progress because you do your gcse or you go to your a level even though if you can't able to go to your a level there is a lots of modules are there mm-hmm. small modules are there you can uh, you know you can do that and then you can achieve where you wanted to and once you become a nurse you can choose you know you want to be adult nurse or you want a child nurse and once you become a nurse there's a lots of opportunities are to grow your ladder because mm. there's a you know, reach up to the nurse consultant you know you can do nurses you can do acps advanced clinical practitioners and fortunately we are getting very good money it's not that it is not a you know it and it's a very thankful job that's mm. what i felt throughout my career very thankful job because i have been awarded many times in this was a manner i have received achievement award i have been awarded four times as a recognition award for a value of a colleague you know it's a very it is a it is a very recognized job and a very respectful job yes. so you to have that awareness of our parents and our children or oh, nobody wanted to do the you know mm-hmm. uh, nursing just for 4 years and then you know the day you qualified you got a job it's not the it's not a jobless it's a, anywhere you go you have a job mm-hmm. and i'm sure you know that certificate is a very good certificate and you will go anywhere in the world you will get a job sure. so my advice for the young women are education is very very important mm-hmm. you know because this age 16 17 18 age is a very crucial age but you know kids they will play around they walk around they never think about the <laughs> parents got lots of money this and that no we individual we every individual should be independent Absolutely. so how do we independent we need an education mm-hmm. isn't it yeah 100% you yeah, you're absolutely right spoken like a true parent there because i'm not true Yeah no alhamdulillah no when you when you at this point you kind of think that you want everyone's kids to do well and you know you 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 we struggle to get where we are we want other people to be get but to get further yeah. and to do that they have to get take the first step and go out and get this education go out and yeah. get the and like sister sarah said if if perhaps you didn't get the gcse's or you didn't get your a levels that you want there's always different routes to get into nursing and different options for you so you know yeah. inshallah but definitely it's a, it's a very very worthwhile career it's very well oh, done like you said um yeah we definitely would encourage people and if if anyone else wants to have more information about uh, the experience of working or you know personal information just drop me an email on uh, on the radio ramadan and i will get back to you um sister sara thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for all you're doing for all your patients and all all, all the community thank you veda thank you so much it's thank you So that brings our show this week to an end. Thank you once again to both of my guests. I hope you've all enjoyed listening to the interviews. I hope they've been valuable to you and I hope they inspire you to go out and do more. Once again, if you have any other information or questions that you want to ask from any of our guests, please get in touch via the email and I'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. Ramadan Mubarak again and remember me in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum.